are recording today's session on cybersecurity. So I ask that you hold your questions until the end. You're welcome to put them in the chat box and I will answer them at the end of the session once we've stopped the recording. But in the meantime, welcome to Midweek Money Matters, where we are talking about the importance of staying safe while we're using the internet. In today's time with being in the midst of a pandemic, we have become more and more reliant on cybersecurity using our internet. So it's important that we know how to do it and remain safe without compromising our personal information or opening us up for becoming victims of identity theft. So whether you use the internet all the time or just every now and again, being able to keep yourself protected is really important. And I think I know most of you on the call today, so I suspect we're using the internet significantly. So today we're gonna to talk about safe web browsing. We'll talk about the importance of strong passwords as well as those pesky security questions that we have to cover. We'll talk about online shopping, and then I want to spend some time talking about social media because the reality is that social media is here to stay, and most of us at some point are going to be using some form of social media, whether we're using Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, some of the others are Pinterest or YouTube or, you know, there's tons and tons of different types of social media platforms. And the reality is that we need to be able to understand what we're doing when we start using them. So we want to start with what I like to call a clean slate, meaning that we want to make sure that our computers, our operating systems and all of the things that run behind the scenes are running in a smooth and updated manner. So in order to make sure that your browsers and your operating systems are all in the most recent versions, I would encourage you to go online and search for is you can put in your favorite search engine is my is my software up to date. You can go into your settings and look for software updates that may be available. And this goes for our full-size computers, our smaller devices, as well as our smartphones and iPads and notebooks. And then we want to make sure that we have an antivirus and a malware protection. And a lot of times those come together. You want to make sure that those are up to date and that they're running behind the scenes and that, that can sometimes slow down our, our machines, but it's better to go slower than to end up accidentally getting a malicious file onto our devices, because once you've done that, it's very difficult to get them off. And it can cause a whole lot of additional problems that we really don't have time to go into, but I'll just mention, you know, they sometimes they, criminals will download software that will lock your computer up and without paying a fee, they're not going to be willing to unlock it. Or sometimes there is malicious virus software that can corrupt your files, or they can go in and take over your email and send email on your behalf, and that just becomes this big mess. So it's really important that we make sure that those devices are up to date and the antivirus and any other malware programs that we have are up to date and running. And then we want to talk about making sure that we're using um, encrypted websites when we are putting any personal information out there. So when you go to my office's website, dobs.pa.gov, that's not a secure site, but it doesn't need to be because you're not giving any of your personal information to us. Now, if you are shopping online, you want to make sure that you are on a secured site before you put your credit card information or any other personal information, including your cell phone number or your address or other types of identifying information. 
So in order to make sure that you are using an encrypted site, you can look at the top of the web browser to make sure that it says HTTPS. And then make sure that you're checking the privacy policy for that website. Make sure that you're comfortable with how the web page is protecting your personal information and make sure you know they know or make sure that you know what they're doing with that information that goes a really long way in making sure that your information is safe and secure now you can also check the trust seal within the web page again that's going to bring up information and tell you about the certificates that they have to keep your information safe and secure if you're using a device that is shared by other people, make sure that you know how to clear that history. About a year and a half ago, when I was out on the road, I had to get into a, I had to log into Yahoo in order to, to get a document that I needed to provide to the hotel. And when I went into the computer at the hotel lobby, when I went to Yahoo, it actually brought up somebody else's email. And that was because there was a toggle button that was automatically clicked to keep you logged into that specific website. Now, if I had been a malicious person, I could have gone through that person's personal emails. And think about some of the things that we have emailed to us. And, you know, some of us were talking before we started that we get emails about bills that may be due. We get emails about our financial information. I get emails from my financial institution telling me that my statements are available. If that information had come in and I had been a malicious person, I could have really wreaked a lot of damage for this person. So make sure if you're using a shared device that when you're done, you look to how to clear the history for the browser. Every browser is a little different, but if you just type it in, how do I clear the history? It will bring up the step-by-step -step instructions and you can find that on the internet. So make sure that you're doing that. Now there is a question about where you can find the trust seals for those websites that we talked about. Often the trust seal is on the lower part of the web page to the right of that page. And they all kind of look a little different. Um, sometimes they say VeriSign or I'm trying to think of one of the other ones. There's like a, a yellow, it looks almost like an armor. Uh, there's a few different ones that are out there, but again, they're typically at the very bottom of the web page on the right hand side. So you can do that as well. So when we're at home using Wi Fi, we want to make sure that we are keeping our router safe and secure with a very strong password. And we don't want to necessarily share that with everyone who comes to visit. My son had a Wi-Fi at his home in Ohio a couple of years ago, and he lived in a house that was, it was a duplex. There was two apartments that were connected. And the woman in the apartment next to him said, you know, can I use your Wi-Fi in order to update my cell phone? And, you know, being a nice guy, my son did that. But what he didn't realize was that that person was very good with computers and not only did he give her access to his Wi-Fi, but because of the knowledge that she had, she was able to access some of his other um, devices, which gave her access to a lot more information that he should have been sharing with her. So make sure that you keep those passwords personal and strong and to yourself. When you're in public, it can be really tempting just to use the public Wi-Fi. But the reality is that when you're using public Wi-Fi, there are people who are infinitely better at computers than I am that can actually go in and see what everybody's doing on their individual devices. So if you're going to use public Wi-Fi, 
know that other people may see what you're doing. And so you really want to avoid any kind of financial or personal transactions or shopping online because that is very, very risky. And we don't want to put our personal information out there where someone else can get to it. So let's talk about passwords. And in my fuller length presentations, I talk a lot about the fact that most people are guilty of using very simple passwords like your favorite grandchild's birthday. Or maybe it maybe you have a base password that you add a couple numbers to at the end. And that makes it really simple for us to remember our passwords. But there are computer programs out there that all they do is try to generate and figure out what our passwords are. So it's important that we don't use the same passwords for all of our different accounts. It's important that we're not using sequential numbers or A, B, C, D, E, F, G. It's critical that we are doing other things. So we want to make sure that our passwords are at least 12 characters. That's a lot of characters, isn't it? They also have to be a mix of capital and lower numbers and symbols. If you're going to use um, maybe a sentence, you could come up with something along the lines of, in 2019, I went on vacation. You can actually take the first letters of each of those words and come up with a password. And then you just have to remember what your phrase was. You can also put together, you know, a list of initials or make up some way that you can remember what those passwords are. And it's important, this is another thing that we don't often think about. It's important that we actually change our passwords frequently. When you work for an agency like the Commonwealth or other bigger corporations, they may require that you change your password every 30, 60, or 90 days. It's important that you don't just add a number to the end of that password. Come up with something that's different or mix it up a little bit so that you have a different password, but it's not going to be something that's very similar, so it's easy to discover. And then the other thing I always like to mention about passwords is that the email password that we have may be the most important. And that's because if I have forgotten my password to my utility company, I can click on a link that says I forgot my password. And all I have to do is put in my email address and they're gonna send me a link to change my password. Well, that's all fine and good unless somebody has access to my email. Remember the guy that I mentioned um, who left himself logged into you, Yahoo? If I had been malicious, I could have gone into any of his financial emails and clicked on, I forgot my password. And that could have allowed me access to changing his passwords. Once I change the passwords, I can get into his accounts. So make sure that you remember that your email password is probably one of the most important passwords to keep safe and secure. If you have to use a password manager, they are available. You can download them as an application. I encourage consumers to research the information before they download any kind of application to their smart device. Make sure that the, men, the, the programmer for that application is credible. Search the internet for reviews about that particular company. Read the reviews that are in the App Store and certainly don't download applications except for through your app store, because they're going to be less likely to have malicious software included with them. 
So let's talk about the security questions. So often it comes pre-populated with that same question. What's your mother's maiden name? Where were you born? Or your pet's name? Those are all things that are very easy to remember or easy to find on social media. So remember that when you're answering those security questions. And keep in mind, and this is something that we don't often think about, but the reality is I don't have to put accurate information. I just have to put an answer in there. So maybe instead of my mother's maiden name, maybe I would put my dog's name, or I could put something completely random, like the, you know, uh, the word blue. It doesn't matter if the question is accurate. What matters is that we have to be able to remember the answer. Now, for those of you who are Commonwealth employees, you'll get a kick out of this. Um, the last time I got a new laptop, we had to set up five questions. And because I do what I do, and I say, you don't have to put the correct answers in, you just have to remember what they were. Well, I did that, and then I couldn't remember what the answers were. So my IT staff actually had to go in and reset my computer. So it, that was a big lesson for me to remember the answers. They didn't have to be correct, but they have to be right. They have to be the right answer to, or you have to put the right word in. So keep that in mind. So let's talk about phishing emails because for, I have to be honest, the reality for me is that I delete 90%, 95% of the emails that I get every single day. If you are not comfortable with that, make sure that you look at a few different things. Make sure you actually know the sender. There's a little trick that you can do if you're on a computer, you can hover the mouse, the cursor over the email address and any links that are in the email. And you can see what pops up. It will tell you act the actual email address or web address that you're going to. That's a really great way to make sure that the sender is who they say they are. But if you're not sure, look for poor grammar or spelling. Oftentimes with phishing emails, they come from foreign countries where they don't speak English well and they'll use a free translator. The problem with free translators is you get what you pay for and the syntax and spelling often are not right. So if you have any doubts at all, delete the email and reach out to that person. Or if it's a, a sale ad or something along those lines, go to the website. If it's a financial institution that you think maybe emailed you, make sure that you actually type in the, the, the web address for that site instead of using links that are in the email because if you click on those links, they may take you to a copycat site where you would put your information in and they've got it, or it can infect your devices. And we talked about that early on in, to, in the session. So we need to, when we're sh uh, shopping online, we wanna make sure that we're using familiar and reputable websites. If it's a new website, search and make sure that you look at reviews for the company. Make sure that you type in the name of the company and the word complaints, or check them out at bbb.org. And if you can, using a prepaid or third-party payment processor like um, PayPal or Venmo is a great resource, or using your credit card so that if your information is compromised, you don't risk losing all of the money that come um, that is available on your bank account. So make sure that you keep that in mind. So let's talk about social media because, um, you know, as I said earlier, that is social media is here to stay. The Department of Banking and Securities has YouTube, LinkedIn, Flickr, tweet, uh, Twitter, and Facebook. 
we don't have Snapchat or Instagram, but they're both really popular as well. And I'm a huge Pinterest fan. So we need to make sure that we're aware of that. When you're when you're using social media, make sure that you you don't make sure that you know that you don't have to accept every single friend request. The reality is if I don't know someone, I don't accept their friend request. I don't need thousands or hundreds of friends. What I need is a social media platform where I have to be careful, but I don't have, you know, I don't want my personal information out there for just anyone. So make sure that you're keeping your personal information personal. When I went on that vacation in 2019, I didn't post anything about it until I came home and I shared pictures. And make sure that you limit the access or the permissions within the within that social media platform to what you're comfortable with. I know in Facebook, you can limit who can see your posts to only your friends. If you're not careful, your friends' friends can see what you're posting or your friend, you know, and it kind of can go, it gets out of control really quickly. So make sure you keep that in mind. Watch what you post, you know, again, telling people, everyone that you're going on vacation next week is a great way to invite someone else to come to your property when you're not home. Disabling the GPS tags, particularly of um, if you're taking pictures of, of people. If I'm not careful, when I take a picture of my grandsons at daycare or at school, if I haven't disabled the tags, if I post that on social media, anybody who sees that picture and has the know-how can get the exact location, the exact date and time that picture was taken. So if I post that and a person who's not friendly gets a hold of the information, I hate to think of the things that can happen. So make sure that you disable the GPS tags in any pictures that you take. Each smart device is a little different, but if you type in your search column, just ask, just simply type in disable GPS tags. It's typically very simple to do. And remember that everything that you post can be permanent, even if you go in and delete it. Other people could have taken screenshots of it or they could have copied it. So that information, even if we delete it, could be considered a permanent record. So make sure that you keep that in mind as well. So let's talk about smart devices. I just have a couple more minutes. Um, more than 65% of us have a smartphone. So we wanna make sure that we keep it up to date. We keep it locked. We need to have a pin number a fingerprint. I actually just upgraded my phone to one that has facial rec recognition and it's been fantastic. Um, and then keep it updated. You know, just like we talked about early on, making sure that our our home devices are updated. We need to make sure that we keep that those um, handheld devices updated as well, because often, particularly with the handheld devices, they're actually, they actually send out fixes for breaches in security settings is often one of the things that's included when we have updates. So making sure that you keep your phone updated is really important. Don't text your personal information, account numbers, social security numbers, those types of things. Never post, send that stuff in a text message and make sure that you know how to remotely restore the factory settings. If you don't know how to do it, you can always call your cell phone provider and they can help you with that. So that's really important. So speaking of privacy settings or, or settings on our devices, make sure that you take the time to read the settings from different public applications or web pages. That font is really small and nobody wants to read it. It's kind of fun to read if you're trying to fall asleep, but make sure that you're comfortable with what 
that organization is doing with your personal information. So often the applications that we download actually sell our information off for a profit to other organizations. And that's how you end up getting so many emails and so many things that pop up on your devices. So make sure that you know what applications and websites are doing with your personal information. As always, I like to provide resources. You can go to dobs.pa.gov and find tons and tons of consumer protection publications as well as investment publications on our website. Also, the state of Pennsylvania on its main website, pa.gov, has a cybersecurity guide. It's a great public, it's a great way to make sure that you're staying on top of cybersecurity in general. That website is maintained by a committee of us that do our best to make sure that it stays current and up to date. So make sure that you check that out. And then Homeland Security actually has a, some really great um, information under cybersecurity as well. So if you want copies of these websites, if you send me an email on the, on the last slide, I'll provide you my email address. I'm happy to send you the slide deck. Um, I know many of you often reach out and get that information, so I'm happy to send that. Our Office of Consumer Services are available during regular business hours, and they are happy to answer whatever questions that you may have. If you have a cybersecurity question or you get an email that you think could be um, a phishing email or it could be a scam, give them a call. They would rather talk to you than have you become a victim and then have to try to recover your money. So make sure you keep that in mind. So that concludes our formal presentation. As I said, here's my email address, katrboyer at pa.gov. I am going to stop our recording and I will invite you to um, go ahead and unmute yourself.